afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. I think we will be joined by more people as the session progresses. It's, it's always difficult to separate people when there's food still to eat. But thank you very much for being here on time for this afternoon's session. Um, I'm Anne Fry, and I'm going to be chairing the session this afternoon. We have a very distinguished panel, so let me start by introducing you to them. Uh, on the far left, and it cleverly follows the order up there, uh, we have Robert Severo, who's Professor of Urban Planning at the University of California, Berkeley, and Director of the Institute of Urban and Regional Development uh, at the University of California Transportation Center. And he's particularly working on uh, sustainable transportation systems. Uh, next to him uh, is Chantal Duchesne, and it's, it's a pleasure to be with uh, Chantal again. Uh, Chantal is a consultant. She was, until recently, Director, uh, Director General of the French Association of Local Authorities Responsible for Transport. And in that capacity, she chaired the um, transport group of the European Council of Municipalities and Regions. So Chantal has been a leading voice in uh, European public transport issues for many years. Next to Chantal, I'm delighted to welcome Angela Glover-Blackwell, uh, who founded Policy Link back in 1999. Um, and as the CEO of Policy Link, she continues to drive its mission of advancing economic and social equity. Um, and I know that Angela will be giving us some very strong messages on social equity, and I think raising some very interesting topics. Um, next to, show, to Angela, we have David Lewis, again, a, an old friend and colleague, old in every sense, David, forgive me, um, who is Senior Vice President of HDR Corporation. He lives in Ottawa, Canada, and in Washington, D.C., generally in the airport between the two, I imagine. He specializes in transportation economics and planning, cost-benefit analysis, and regulatory assessment. Um, and again, has been active in the field of uh, the, the underlying economic issues for mobility uh, for many years. And next to David is Gitam Tiwari, uh, who is Professor and Chair of the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Uh, Gitam has extensive research experience in dealing with the transport uh, issues of low-income countries and the development of systems and designs to make transport more efficient, safer and less polluting. We did have uh, a further panel member, uh, Valery Seleshnev from Russia, uh, very sadly, we've heard that his son was uh, involved in the Marrakesh uh, cafe bombing and is critically ill. So, obviously, he's not with us, and I'm sure you'll join with me in sending our, our sympathy and good wishes to him. So, we have represented here in the panel a very wide range of expertise across a range of different issues. We are interested in... Uh, rural deprivation, we're interested in gender issues, in the different uh, concerns and needs that women have from transport. We're interested in economically disadvantaged people, um, in uh, people of color, in people in developing countries. So we have a wide spectrum uh, of perspectives, but the common theme that I hope we can develop this afternoon is that in many cases and in many places, transport planning, land use planning, is failing the people that we're concerned about. We are finding that there are people left behind, as we say in the title. So what I want to focus on, and I want to engage all of you right from the start in this, is what can we do to make sure that we don't continue to perpetuate the design and uh, development of transport systems that exclude people because they live in the wrong place or they haven't got the money to pay uh, or for whatever reason it might be. So I hope that we can focus as much on the practical ways forward as on the economic problems that underlie this. So I'm looking forward to a very lively debate. We're going to start by asking each of our panel members just briefly to give us a few of their, if you like, their headline thoughts. And then I want to start to develop the discussion uh, and to bring all of you in really from the beginning. So that's the, that's the plan. We have at least two economists on the panel, so we'll have at least six opinions just from them. Um, but I hope we will have some common themes that we can develop as well as exploring some of the, uh, the disparate ones. So Robert, can I ask you to uh, kick off? Sorry, David, I think looking at it now, I think it probably makes sense to take it that way. I apologize for you. Uh. 
Th thank you, Ann. Uh, good afternoon, and I, I want to thank the sponsors for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I was told I had four minutes, and uh, I figure I can make four points, one point per minute, so let me just sort of launch right into it. Um, I, I think it's important that this is the only panel that actually has the word access in the title. Um, and to me, it, it's pretty basic and fundamental, but important that uh, we, we all know that we don't hop in trains and cars and on bikes for purposes of movement. It's really about people going to places. And access really is the term that I think really gets at the core why uh, we're here. Uh, we can enhance access, obviously, by speed. But very importantly, we can bring point A and point B closer together through good urban management and land use planning. Uh, we, we heard uh, this morning quite a bit about mobility as a right or a, a social entitlement, and I, I would submit access is very much the same. Um, even in advanced economies like the United States, 30 to 40 percent of the population does not have access to a car. Uh, they're too young. They're 16 years or, young, or, or younger. They, they don't have a driver's license. They're too old or, or their eyesight challenged or infirmed or, or frail. Uh, they're disabled or uh, perhaps they're too poor. And then in the very poor countries of the world, 85% in countries like uh, Bangladesh do not have access to cars. So if we have car-oriented cities, uh, very much products of the industrialized, modernized world where origins and destinations are so far apart, the only way to get around is by mechanized transport. Those folks are very much uh, left out in the socioeconomic life of the city. So I, to me, it, it is a moral mandate uh, that given the, the preponderance of large segments of the population that fully cannot participate in all of societal offerings, uh, that every bit as much as I would say sanitary facilities, potable water is, is a right, so is access. Uh, the second point I guess I, I'd like to underscore is affordability is an important part of access. Uh, in the developing world, in cities like Delhi, Nairobi, um, Mexico City, a fair number of studies have been done showing uh, that significant segments of the population uh, upwards of sometimes 30 to 40 percent of largely low-income folks living in squatters on the periphery are spending 25, sometimes as much as 30 percent of their daily earnings on transportation. Basically what they're trading off is very cheap housing on the periphery, but very high transportation cost. And they're not accumulating assets of any kind of wealth. Uh, so it, it's, you know, in countries like Brazil, they set a, ma a normative maximum of 77% of income should go to transport. Anything above that, employers are supposed to pay. That's the transport valid program. But the problem is, even in Brazil, half the labor force in the, in the informal economy. So how do we create affordable transport, I think, is, is, is a very big uh, challenge. Part of it in the developing world is there's not good quality public transport. They're dependent on informal, multiple service providers that set market rate fares. And often they have to pay two to three different jitneys and jeepneys and collectivos that collectively really take a big share of their income. Um, so how do we create affordable transport where clearly uh, government can underwrite the cost? Um, and we've had a lot of experiences with that, high subsidies. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily financially sustainable, particularly in these cash-strapped uh, times. So how, you know, the, probably the best way we can do it is try to drive down costs, contain costs. And maybe competitive tendering can do that. We've had a lot of experiences with that. Studies suggest you can maybe reduce uh, operating costs for public transport by 40%. But that's only when you have contestable markets and only when you really have um, good public oversight to ensure fair and socially desirable services are delivered. All too often, the marginal markets, which a lot of poor people are dependent on, off-peak periods when they have jobs in, in the uh, service industries, for instance, on weekends and night when many times the private vendors are not serving. Uh, another important point, I think, um, is that uh, we need many more service price points as it re, re, uh, re relates to public transport offerings. And I would submit somewhat opening up the marketplace to more paratransit. It would be one way to provide more offerings uh, to make transit affordable. Um, one of the issues, though, is we've largely subsidized transit through what are called provider-side subsidies going to operators. All the experiences tell us that generally gets leaked away in higher wage rates without commensurate improvements in services. I would argue that paratransit with user-side subsidies administered by social uh, service agencies probably would be better ways to um, make transit more affordable.